All right, in our statics review videos, we've done the course of overview and the objects. Now we're working on loads. This is the second version of this one where we want to talk about distributed forces. Well, the, specifically the classification and manipulation thereof, <clears throat> and then centroids and the special case of fluid pressure. Fluid pressure is nothing other than a special case of a distributed force. So distributed loads have two major principles. The first one is that the magnitude of the equivalent point load is equal to the area under the load intensity diagram. So if I have this triangle right here is my load intensity diagram, the area under that is one half times two times five, or five kilonewtons. And that will act at the centroid of the load intensity diagram. So my centroid is a triangle, so that five kilonewtons is going to act a third of the way from the big end, five thirds meters from the wall. Which brings us to centroids. You've got to know how to find the centroid if you haven't got something simple like a triangle or a rectangle. The formulas you really need to be aware of are this one, and it's equivalent with integrals here. So x bar is the integral of x dA over the, over the integral dA. This is useful for the centroid of the line. You need to be able to get from each of the integral formulas for the centroid of the weight, the centroid of the mass, the centroid of the area, the centroid of the volume, centroid, whatever the centroids are, all of the areas, all the integrals are essentially the same. This is the first moment of the area. That's the numerator of all of those integrals. We, we did it two different ways. We did it by integration, where we were looking at these stripes of differential areas. And remember, we spent a fair bit of time dealing with those stripes. And when you actually integrate this, so that x bar is the integral of x dA over the integral dA. You have to remember that this x right here needs to be the centroid of the differential area. So if I'm looking down here, I need to have that dot, that location of that dot, the actual coordinates of it, how far over, how far up. Those are the things that go in the integral. And I asked you, remember, not to actually figure out and memorize any of these formulas, but simply to understand that fact. When you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, a horizontal differential element like that, your coordinate for the center of the differential area is not going to be x for the horizon, horizontal one, because you have to actually figure out what that would be. So if you went all the way over, you'd get to a, and if you came back halfway along, you'd get a minus x minus a over 2, which is, or a minus x over 2, which is how you get to this formula. Again, you don't want to memorize that. You don't want to memorize the polar ones either. What you need to know here is that this is a triangle. Any triangle has its centroid two-thirds of the way out. So that what you end up with here, then, is this nice yellow triangle there, and you know where this, the, the coordinate of that is going to be two-thirds r cosine theta and two-thirds r sine theta. Let me get rid of some of that now so you can see the formulas. The weight is going to act at the centroid of the member, and anything that's symmetric is going to have the centroid being in the middle. The other way we did centroids is with composite body methods. The four that you are responsible for remembering are circles, rectangles, right triangles, and semicircles. This is really the only one that might be a challenge for you. The others are probably something you've already memorized. If you are stuck and you cannot remember what it is, you can always sort of say, well, if I'm looking at a semicircle, it's going to be something like halfway but not yet halfway. And you know that the R has to be in the top because it's the only way you get the right units. Once you have those four memorized, these in your chart, this these rows, the X bar and the Y bar, are the coordinates, coordinates for the centroid of each of your areas. And these are the areas of each of your areas. This is just multiply X bar times A and Y bar times A. So then you have these three columns, add them up, and divide one column by the sum of the areas and another column by the sum of the areas. That's composite body methods. We also talked about bodies of revolution, where you have the volume or the surface area of a body of revolution, and those are formulas that are just easier than trying to figure out what the air volumes would be by triple integrations or anything. Fluid pressure is a distributed load. Here, look, here's your load intensity diagram. What you need to remember is that this height right here, the, the, the 
bottom of that triangle is given by rho gh. So that's your formula you gotta know. Distributed, it's a distributed load that's linearly increasing, so as you go down you know that from here to here, this is a connect the dots kind of line. It acts perpendicular to the surface, even if you have a surface that's not straight up and down. Uh, you do need to know what these formulas are, that what the numbers are. So density for fresh water is one megagram per meter cubed or a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. Hint, remember that newtons are kilograms meters per second squared. Your specific density is what we usually use for water. Gamma for fresh water is 62.4 pounds per feet cubed. Now, in general, the, the point here is to ask yourself, what's the pressure here? What's the pressure there? And then connect the dots. So at A, you're going to have rho G2. At B, you're going to have rho G3. And if you connect the dots, you then know what your shape is for your load intensity diagram. It's the same thing with all of these. Connect the dots. So if you have what's the pressure here, it's going to be zero. What's the pressure here? Two feet down, it's going to be rho G2. Connect the dots. That's your load intensity diagram. Now, we did actually work this backwards a little bit and say it's much easier when I'm doing equilibrium equations to say I have a horizontal force and a vertical force. The vertical force is rho g times the volume of the water above the gate. So this is my above the gate. The volume of that into the page, that wedge of water times rho g is the weight of the water. The horizontal pressure is the same even if it didn't have any straight sides. So you're going to have, in this case, one half rho g h times h times the depth in the page. I'm leaving that one for a minute, let's look over here at the silt. Oops. At the silt, I'm going to have, what's the pressure at the top? Zero. What's the pressure at the bottom of the water? Rho of water times g times whatever this depth is. So if we let that be 4, then this is rho g4. That's rho of the water. So my load intensity diagram for the first, the top part, has rho water g4, and it's 4 meters down. Now, what is the pressure that comes from the silt? It starts at rho water times g4. How does it increase? If I go two meters down, how does this increase? It's going to increase by whatever it was at the beginning. And it's now rho of silt G2 more. So here I have a nice trapezoid or a rectangle and a triangle, as you wish. The last thing I want you to sort of remember when you're dealing with water pressure is no matter what you're doing, you have the force of the water at the top, the force of the water at the bottom, and connect the dots. Remember that if all else fails, you can always integrate.